Okay, let me tell you something. The Filipino community lost their goddamn minds when they first saw the trailer for Raya and the Last Dragon. And I know exactly why this is. See, when you're Filipino or Filipino-American such as yours truly, you're expected to fulfill certain obligations. One of which is that you kind of have to go apeshit when someone of Filipino descent makes any kind of international achievement. You know, like Manny Pacquiao or this mascot that haunts my dreams at night. We call this little phenomenon Pinoy Pride. As for how this relates to Raya and the Last Dragon, well, it turns out that the Philippines was just one of the many Southeast Asian countries that inspired the film. And that was very much apparent by all this stuff I didn't notice until my parents pointed it out. Now, when I was watching Raya and the Last Dragon, I could have been all like, Whoa, check out all this exclusively Filipino content! I'm so proud to see my culture in the mainstream consciousness! I feel so seen! And to an extent, I was. I think it's hella important that Filipinos have their voices heard, especially in the creative arts industry. But I also know that Disney would never produce a film based on any specific Asian culture, unless there was money to be made there. Like, obviously, Raya and the Last Dragon is supposed to be Southeast Asian inspired, with all the vagueness you can hope for. So I don't really think it's worth arguing whether this or that culture thing belongs to us, you know? What I do think is worth discussing is just how beautiful my culture really is and why stories inspired by it are worth telling. Granted, I'm kind of a banana, so I can only give an outsider's perspective, and my current knowledge doesn't necessarily reflect the deeper nuances of our heritage. But seeing as how I'm a phil am trippist <laughs> I see this as a good opportunity to not only share my culture with all of you, but to learn more about it myself. Anyway, enough bullshit. So, probably the first thing that my Pinoy peeps collectively jizzed over is the fact that Raya's battling style is a real-life martial art known as Arnis. Arnis, along with Kali and Eskrima, each serve different purposes, but more or less are the three branches of the Filipino martial arts. Now, according to my folks and some dudes on Twitter, the Arnis fighting style is defined mostly by its use of very handy weapons, such as sticks, swords, knives, etc. And on the flip side, it also applies good old fisticuffs to initiate moves like grappling and weapons disarming. Though nowadays, modern Arnis tends to be more self-defense oriented to keep with the times. But next to Eskrima sticks, blades are a common go-to weapon for our niece. And it definitely ties into this dope-ass sword that Raya adopted from her dad. This little beauty is called a Moro Crease. And if it were a D&D &D weapon, you'd get both slashing and piercing damage. What with it being a double-edged sword and all. Historically, you could sort of call it the evolved form of the Kuris Daggers of Indonesia. And were commonly used on the island of Minindao. And you see how it's got all these wavy edges and stuff? That's one of the sword's key attributes. Apparently, it was designed that way to make it easier to dislodge out of your opponent's rotting corpse. How convenient. You know, I noticed that Filipinos seem to favor maneuverability as opposed to raw power. Then again, I've never been in a fight, so the fuck do I know? I think it's time I transitioned into something a little more up my alley. Design. I feel it's no exaggeration to say that this movie's art direction is just mwah. And the first Filipino design I want to mention here is the one that every Phil Am, except for me, recognized at first glance. The Salakot. This inverted ice cream cone looking thing is a very traditional and very lightweight type of headgear used to protect you from the sun and rain. It's usually made out of some firm plants like bamboo and nito ferns and... that's about it. Honestly, the salakot doesn't really differ much in terms of practicality when compared to other Asian canonical hats, so its significance in the Philippines is mostly symbolic from what I know. Apparently, it was worn a lot by the stuffy old aristocrats known as the Principalia during our Spanish colonial days, so that's how it ended up contributing to our heritage. Now to get into the more, uh, reading between the lines Panoy stuff. So you know these tribes of Kumandra? I know a lot of people were kind of going off saying how these guys were actually so-and-so country and those guys were actually so-and-so culture. Now, like I said, there's no way in hell Disney would make any of these dudes a direct translation to an actual country. But if I had to decide which is probably the most Filipino inspired, I'd probably have to go with, uh, Talon. So here's my thinking. 
See, a lot of folks were put off by this overabundance of purple these dudes were sporting, and with good reason to. From what I understand, natural purple dyes were notoriously hard to get back in the day, and such textiles were typically only available to European nobles. However, the Philippines does have a naturally purple substance, and that my friends is the purple yam, or more commonly known as ube. Aside from making a damn good ice cream, ube is rich and variable in its purple color, so I suppose you could extract its dye to make the kinds of clothing these Talon guys wear. But beyond that, I also noticed that the actual land the Talon tribe inhabit also has its Filipino roots. You might have noticed how Talon had their houses and establishments made out of these wooden looking materials and raised over a peninsula, yeah? Well, this is a legit thing that we've got going on in the Philippines. And other Southeast Asian and Polynesian cultures, but you know what I mean. These buildings are called Bahai Kubo, which are essentially stilt houses built on, well, stilts. Okay, fine. Specifically, they're made out of organic materials like nipa palm, bamboo, plant fiber, and grass. And they're pretty fucking practical too, cause like, the elevation protects you from floods and hot soil, and it's super easy to repair cause like, you've got the material right outside your doorstep. But to me, Bahai Kubo are pretty neat because they tie into our culture of togetherness. See, the actual buildings don't really have partitions, cause Filipino families generally like to share the same space. The whole infrastructure of Bahai Kubos is pretty communal really, as buildings are often tightly knit to welcome your neighbors and friends, who are more or less treated as part of the family. Granted, my introverted ass probably couldn't live in one, but I still appreciate its purpose. Alright y'all, let's talk about dragons, Sisu specifically. I love her man, she's just so optimistic it's infectious, you know? Doesn't hurt that Aquafina is charismatic as all hell either. Anyway, as far as Filipino inspiration goes, there probably isn't much. Sisu most likely symbolizes Eastern style dragons in general, which, you know, anything's a step up from another Eddie Murphy situation. But if I had to pick a figure from Filipino mythology closest to Sisu, it would probably have to be the Bakunawa. This majestic sea serpentine creature was widely known for its habit of eating moons. As a result, it's often associated with causing eclipses, though it has been known for causing earthquakes, hurricanes, and rain, so there's that. And it may have a sister or a lover, depending on which account you're reading, though most stories usually end with pissed off Filipinos clanging their pots and pans to scare the Bakunawa into regurgitating the moon. Yeah, maybe I'm overreaching on this one. Though there are cases of ancient Filipino swords having the Bakunawa ornamented on the hilt, so who knows? Also, I know it's not culturally accurate or whatever, but I fucking love Sisu's color scheme, man. Like that shade of blue, it's just, it's just my thing, alright? And the last distinctly Filipino reference I found in Raya and the Last Dragon was actually not in the movie itself. So you know how this film committed blasphemy by being a Disney fantasy movie that isn't a musical? Well, the one song we did get, Lead the Way by Janae Aiko, really good song by the way, has an official Tagalog version. Translated as Gabay, which loosely means to lead or to guide, this rendition is sung by the esteemed KZ Tandigan, who is known for... Uh, hold on. Okay, so, KZ Tandigan won the first season of the X Factor Philippines edition back in 2012, had a song that scored number two on the Philippines billboard, she won the Singing Bee reality show, again Pinoy edition, and became known internationally when she competed on Singer 2018. Oh, and apparently she's a hella good rapper too, which, okay, that's pretty boss. But otherwise, I think that's all I've got as far as Filipino representation goes. I mean, there are a few tangentially Filipino things in the background, like the food they eat. But again, that could very much be applicable to other Southeast Asian cultures as well. In that respect, I think it's important for my Pinoy peeps to acknowledge that just because our culture isn't explicitly shown, doesn't mean our influence isn't there. I mean, every generic European medieval fantasy story does the same thing, so isn't it actually doing our culture more good by being in the public subconscious? Whatever, man. I think Raya and the Last Dragon is a kick-ass movie, and Cease is my homegirl. 9 out of 10, would watch again. Peace! By the way, Raya and Namari are gay as fuck, man. Like, I'm not even being ship trash here. Even Kelly Marie Tran thinks so. I'm just saying. Anyway, if you guys like my content, 
please consider supporting me on my Patreon. Link in the description. Additionally, you can show your support by leaving a like, a comment, sharing this video, and hitting that subscribe button. Until then, mamaya ah!